Thank you, uh, Roman. Uh, uh, I'm going to just give a brief introduction before it would be an excellent talk. Uh, and I was trying to think about how to describe that uh, Dr. Quinley, and I thought about it as an analogy of a book. Uh, on the front cover would be Emma Quigley, who's currently professor of medicine, uh, and David, and we were under the chair of medicine and digestive disorders at the Cornell Medical College, and chief of uh, genetic pathology at the Houston Methodist. So that'd be on the cover. On the back cover would be the fact that he's the former uh, president of the American College of Gastroenterology and the World uh, Gastroenterology Organization, and also uh, for two, two terms out of the American Journal of Gastroenterology. And, and the lighter notes inside would be uh, some of the other things that he's originally from Cork, Ireland, uh, and I think he's internal medicine in Glasgow, Scotland, and the GI training in first of Mayo, where we were fellows together in the early 1980s. And then uh, went back to Manchester in England, uh, then back to the US in Omaha, where he was for a number of years, then back again to Cork, where he was dean in 2000, 2007. So uh, that's one line. The other line I would note that he's internationally known for research on GMO food disorders. <laughs> Talk about the AG and his group. Uh, his, his group in Cork really have been one of the premier, if not the premier, center on uh, the stool biome, which we talked about yesterday at the Convention Society of Gastroenterology, which is part of the TMA, right, right next door to the competition. Uh, 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 he's published more than 600 uh, periodic uh, so that would be kind of the middle of the, of the book. And uh, uh, I would I would say that uh, he's one of the few people I know that not only excels in clinical clinical research and research, but also in uh, academic leadership and in uh, medical politics. There are very few people in the world that I know that do all five of those things pretty well. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Quigley. <laughs> no, it's been a great pleasure to be here. I think it's my third visit to, to Louisville, and I've enjoyed everyone who's included this one enormously. Now, I've asked to list my disclosures, which are here. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is a subject uh, that has probably been ignored, but I hope I will convince you by the end of this talk that there actually is some new activity going on in this area. So let's go back a few years and think about the traditional view of the irritable bowel syndrome. It was viewed by most doctors as a nuisance rather than a syndrome, as not being a real entity, but one brought on by the individual by stress or by anxiety. The main issue for the physician was to exclude important real or organic disease, does not merit very serious scientific investigation, and of course there were no worthwhile treatments. Now unfortunately some of these statements have not changed, but some I hope I will convince you have. So where are we, are we today with the Irritable Bowel Syndrome? But first, I think we have a change of perspective. It is now realized, and I think this is a the observation, that Irritable Bowel Syndrome is common worldwide and is a very significant healthcare burden. For some, it can be disabling, as disabling as many quote-unquote organic disorders. <coughs> it also has a very varying phenotype, which has caused a lot of difficulty in terms of not only describing this, disorder, but also in studying it. The etiology is unclear, but the concept of the gut-brain axis is thought to play a pivotal role and is a, act as a very useful paradigm for studying this disorder. But as I will show you later, new avenues are being explored. Therapeutic options remain limited, but considerable progress has been made, and fortunately, at least in recent years, interest in studying this area and in developing new treatments has been rekindled. Now, I heard that Dr. Roman was very interested in history, so I actually am going to uh, start uh, with a historical piece. And this is a paper that was written over 50 years ago now uh, by somebody that I think is <coughs> the father of clinical gastroenterology, a man called Sidney Trullo. And he worked in Oxford for his entire medical career, never actually became a professor, because clinically people at that time didn't become professors, uh, which is a shame. 
And when he was, became famous for his work on inflammatory bowel disease, and he made several key discoveries <coughs> in the clinic, clinical observations there of inflammatory bowel disease, but he also wrote this paper <coughs> on the irritable colon syndrome, as he called it. And it's very refreshing uh, to look back on this paper, because when you read it, you see observations that remain as true today as they did then. In fact, there were some observations they made which were ignored for many years and now regarded as standard components of irritable bowel syndrome. For example, they said the condition was seen twice as commonly in women as in men. <coughs> Correct. They said pain of colonic origin was present in the majority of the patients, which is now the fundamental feature of the irritable bowel syndrome. They described the, vari the variable bowel habit, sometimes being normal, sometimes associated with constipation or diarrhea or with both of these symptoms alternating. <coughs> After many years, this became enshrined as the so-called Rome criteria for the definition of irritable bowel syndrome. In more than half of the patients, the act of defecation was followed by temporary recoup pain, a hallmark of colitis. Very interestingly, uh, they described non-GI features, which again were ignored for many years, such as fatigue, loss of mental concentration, and the association in some patients with depression and anxiety. They also noted that in 34 of their patients, the symptoms dated from an attack of infective dysentery, either proven or strongly presumptive. That now we know as opposed to <coughs> And they also spoke about prognosis. Remember, this was just a few series that they were describing. And indeed, these uh, conclusions with regard to prognosis have been verified in several large-scale community-based studies since then shown that about a third improved a small number of become symptom-free, but the majority continue to smolder on with similar symptoms. Now this is a map <coughs> a few years ago from uh, a, a review that I was involved in that shows you that irritable bowel syndrome has been described virtually everywhere it's been sought. <coughs> and this was a more recent uh, table looking just at, it actually is one of several tables in different parts of the world, uh, looking at the prevalence of IBS in Asia. Now, as you can see, there are tremendous variations here from some very low rates here in Iran to much higher rates here in Japan. But what I, all I want to show you what, based on this is that irritable bowel syndrome is prevalent throughout the world. And this is interesting because, of course, diet, genetics, etc., vary tremendously throughout the world. So what does this mean? Does that mean that genetics environment and diet play a little role, we don't know. But I think it's a conundrum that needs to be addressed. Now, is irritable bowel syndrome important? Uh, I'm just going to show you one piece of data to illustrate some of the impacts of irritable bowel syndrome. Even though irritable bowel syndrome predominantly affects women, and typically women of childbearing age, there's little or no data on <coughs> the impact of IBS on pregnancy. This is a study we did a few years ago because we had access through Ali Kachan, who's the first author, to an enormous database in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so we were able to look at the range of a whole host of pregnancy outcomes in um, females who had irritable bowel syndrome or who did not. And we, what we found was that the rates of spontaneous abortion and ectopic pregnancy were significantly increased in IBS patients. You can see the odds ratio here, 1.26. To 0.42. And were increased even more among IBS patients when IBS and depression and anxiety. Why this is, we don't know, but I point to it as another manifestation of the impact of irritable bowel syndrome. <coughs> now, I mentioned the concept of post infectious IBS, and I think many would agree that the description of post infectious IBS, or I should say the more recent description of post infectious IBS, has been a game changer in this area. True love and child they described it many years ago, but it wasn't until large surveys of outbreaks of gastroenteritis showed that a significant number of people who had to develop IBS that this was not fully understood. So there have been many studies from all over the world which show that about 10 to 35 percent of individuals who previously were symptom free will go on to develop irritable bowel syndrome following an episode of confirmed bacterial gastroenteritis. More recently, there have been studies showing somewhat lower rates of post-infectious IBS for viral infections and for, um, um, other, or for amoebic dysentery and other infections. <coughs> From these studies, several risk factors for the development of post-infectious IBS have been identified, including being female, 
having a severe episode of gastroenteritis, very interestingly, again reflecting this cut brain axis, the interaction between brain and gut, uh, people who have pre-morbid and psychological issues such as depression are also more prone. But very interestingly, it, it was also noted that patients who have a persistent inflammatory response to an enteric infection are also likely to go on to develop ideas. And more recently, the group from McMaster identified a number of genetic markers that seem to be predisposed to post infectious ideas. Most of these genes code for uh, the inflammatory response or for interaction with bacteria. So here you can see three groups of individuals, a group who developed post infectious ideas, a group of individuals who had gastroenteritis but did not develop ideas, and normal volunteers. And you can see increased levels of enterochromocin cells and increased levels of uh, nanopropia T lymphocytes in the group who were destined to develop post infectious ideas. And from this, uh, you can develop an interesting <coughs> paradigm which suggests that a disturbance in the gut flora, in the case of gastroenteritis, of course, being an overwhelming one, in a susceptible individual, and I've listed some of the susceptibility factors, can lead to a sustained inflammatory response, which we know from a lot of laboratory work uh, can lead to myeluric dysfunction in the gut wall and to the symptoms that we recognize as early bad syndrome. But of course, most patients with IBS do not give a history of prior infection. So what is the pathophysiology of IBS in general? Well, there have been many postulates. I've already alluded to the genetic issue. Basically, at this stage, it's unclear to what extent the common occurrence of IBS among families relates to nature or nurture. For many years, irritable bowel syndrome was assumed to be a motility disorder, and certainly uh, hypercontractility, particularly in the colon, can lead to symptoms of IBS, but there does not seem to be a unifying underlying motility of the mouth in these patients. Anybody who's done any type of intervention in an IBS patient will know that they have visceral hypersensitivity. Again, it's a common feature, but it does not seem to be a unifying underlying. The advent of uh, advanced brain, brain imaging techniques has uh, identified differences in the perception of visceral events in IBS patients compared to controls. What exactly this means is unclear. In all of these studies in IBS, psychopathology is a confounding factor. IBS is not a psychiatric disorder, but if you have IBS and depression <coughs> or anxiety, you are more severely impaired, you're more likely to go see a doctor, and your prognosis is worse. But it's a significant confounder in all studies. I've already alluded to the possible role of infection and inflammation, and we'll also discuss the possibility that there may be an altered microbiota in IBS. So if we start looking at the physiology of IBS, we can start in the human. And certainly, there are several factors here which have been implicated in the pathogenesis of symptoms, such as diet, and the products of digestion, gas within the lumen, and bacteria, and I'll talk about these briefly. <clears throat> now, why are these important? <clears throat> if you take a history from a patient with IBS, in particular from a female with IBS, there are three factors which they may identify that precipitate symptoms. Food ingestion, stress, and menstrual cycle. <clears throat> Unfortunately, even though stress has been extensively investigated, we have not listened to the patients, and we have not paid enough attention to the food, the role of food in the, in the provocation of symptoms in IBS. This is a very simple study we did in our clinic a couple of years ago uh, with a dietitian, where we simply asked patients about perceived food intolerance, and then we asked them what have they done about it. And as you can see here, 90% of IBS patients perceived some form of food intolerance, most commonly cereals. Uh, but also fatty foods, vegetables, and spicy foods. And this actually is no different to other surveys that have been performed. More worrying is that 92% of the IBS patients had instituted some form of dietary restriction, in particular in products, vegetables, and fruits, in order to alleviate their symptoms. And in doing so, only a small proportion saw professional healthcare advice on these dietary restrictions. And what I'm not showing you here is additional data from that study which shows that some of these people are actually running the risk of running into significant nutritional deficiencies because of these self-imposed dietary restrictions. Now, why does food provoke symptoms in IBS? The answer is there are probably several reasons. There is work to suggest that some of the components 
such as pan <coughs> containing foods may be important. And indeed, experimentally, depletion or augmentation of tryptophan has been shown to increase anxiety and GI symptoms in IBS. In my clinic, whether with skits in Houston or in Cork, the majority of these patients think they have a food allergy. Most do not. Uh, there is little evidence for a role for traditional IgE-mediated food allergy in IBS. There is some debate about other, perhaps IgG-mediated uh, mechanisms, but this remains controversial. What seems to be clear, however, is that food intolerance <coughs> is important, and here two factors have particularly uh, come to the fore. One is the potential for gluten intolerance, not celiac disease, but gluten intolerance in these patients, and secondly, the role of these FODMAPs, these uh, fructose oligosaccharides, disaccharides, uh, monosaccharides, and polyols, uh, commonly found in fruits and vegetables, and a diet, a low FODMAPs diet, has had to some success in IBS. But of course, everything we eat can interact with the gut flora, so that may be an important mechanism. Which brings me uh, to what would be a central part of the presentation, namely the role of the microbiota and inflammatory responses in IBS. <coughs> now, there are several lines of evidence, you could say none of them conclusive, that suggest that there's a role for the gut flora in IBS. I've already described possible infectious IBS, but I've emphasized that that may apply to only a limited number of patients. There has been a suggestion that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is common in IBS. It's a controversial area. My own belief is that this is not a major issue, and I present some data on an old story. But of course, clinicians would have recognized for decades that several of the symptoms in IBS could result from an alteration in the flora. For example, an increase or decrease in bile salty conjugation could lead to changes in stool volume and consistency an increase or decrease in bacterial fermentation and production of gases could lead to an increase in gas volume or composition. And as already alluded to, food microbiota interactions could explain food-related symptoms. If uh, one believes, as some do, that there is a low-grade pro-inflammatory state in IBS, then the bacteria could be an initiator uh, or provoker of this. And finally, uh, perhaps the most convincing evidence for clinicians there is data to suggest that certain antibiotics and probiotics that can modulate symptoms in IBS. So let's look at the colonic flora. Well, this is the first study that we did, <coughs> and this is using DGGE. And basically, each of these columns here is the, the fingerprint of the microbiota in, this, in from the biopsies and from stool in the same IBS patient. So patient 1 and patient 11 are identical, etc. Firstly, we noticed that there was considerable variability in the fecal flora, but minimal variability in the biopsy flora, which is, of course, a warning to us about the importance of the source of material when you're looking at the microbiota. Well, we did notice, as others have, that the diversity of the flora was significantly reduced in irritable bowel syndrome. Unfortunately, this is actually expressed as similarity, which, of course, is the inverse of diversity, but you can see that the similarity or decrease in diversity was greater in IBS than in healthy controls. <coughs> More recently, we had an opportunity to do high throughput sequencing of the microbiome in IBS. And in these principal component plots here, we were initially quite disappointed because we saw considerable overlap and, in fact, very little difference between the controls and the IBS subjects. <coughs> And these were laid out in a different manner. It became clear, actually, that IBS is literally no surprise, given the diversity of the phenotype. It became clear that there actually were different subgroups within the IBS population, some of whom shown in blue overlapped completely with normal controls. Others shown in red were completely different. So now we redrew our axes, and we can now see clear separation. And then, because this cohort has been very clearly defined and defined in great detail, I should hasten that by us, by Magnus Simren, who was our collaborator, we were able to look at what clinical features drove this difference in the microbiota between these two groups of IBS group B. The normal like group or the abnormal group with the high firmicutase to factor identities ratio. And what you can see here is that of all the various <coughs> clinical and physiological parameters <coughs> we looked at, the only one which clearly <coughs> differentiated these two groups was the presence of depression and anxiety. And this was surprising. But basically what we found was that those who had a normal microbiota were much more likely to be anxious and depressed. Those who had an abnormal microbiome were much more likely to have a normal psychological state. 
<coughs> so let's move on to other aspects of the uh, GI tract in IBS. And here I want to, <coughs> to explore <coughs> a very simplistic model because, as is public here already, I'm not an immunologist, nor am I a microbiologist. <coughs> Excuse me. So my paradigm for looking at the interaction between the microbiota and the host in IBS is as follows. So here we've got a number of factors, which could be diet, could be dietary products, products of digestion, could be the microbiota, could be various other things. And here we've got the gut barrier. I will not discuss this in any great detail, <coughs> except to say that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that gut barrier dysfunction is common in irritable bowel syndrome. But let's say that we've got uh, some factors in the lumen, bacteria or products of bacteria, in an individual who's got a disrupted a gut barrier with increased intestinal permeability. This will allow access to the subepithelial compartment to mast cells and to lymphocytes, which can lead to mast cell activation, immune activation, with the production of uh, mast cell uh, cryptase, with schemokines and cytokines, which are all known to stimulate and carry nerves, and which can induce local or even long reflexes that can reduce the symptoms of IBS. So that's the model that we're going to explore. And of course, this can go much more, uh, much, much farther, and indeed uh, activate uh, centrally, lead to autonomic or central reflexes, which have all been described in the bowel syndrome. So what's the evidence for this? Well, our first foray into this came as part of a randomized <coughs> controlled trial of a probiotic we did a few years ago. I'm really not going to talk about the probiotic data, <coughs> but as part of this, we connected peripheral blood mononuclear cells from three groups of IBS patients and healthy volunteers. And as a very simplistic and crude measure of, of inflammatory tone, we <coughs> measured the ratio between IL-10 and anti-inflammatory cytokine and IL-12 and inflammatory cytokine. And here's the ratio in healthy volunteers. And I will draw your attention only to the stipple bars. And as a the baseline, in each of the three IBS groups, this ratio was significantly tilted in a pro-inflammatory direction. <coughs> Now, <coughs> a few years later, with the advent of uh, highly sensitive kids, we were actually able to measure cytokines in peripheral blood in IBS patients and show that levels of IL-6 in a solid receptor, and not shown here, also IL-8, important <coughs> pro-inflammatory cytokines are significantly elevated in irritable bowel syndrome. As I alluded to from the original work of Sidney Trulove and from some other data, comorbidities are common in IBS. So we asked the question, could these changes in cytokines be a reflection of IBS itself or comorbidity? So then we went on to look at two groups of individuals, a group of IBS subjects who had no comorbidity, had so-called pure IBS, and a group of individuals had had significant comorbidities like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. So let's look at the pure group first. And again, as in our previous studies, we showed elevated levels of IL-6 and IL-8, but all the other cytokines that we measured like IL-1 beta or TNF alpha were no different than controllers. However, when we looked at the extrant, the hormone group, again we saw elevated levels of IL-6 and IL-8, but now also see some elevated levels of IL-1 beta and as shown here, TNF alpha, suggesting that, these, that there really was a different immunological phenotype between these two groups of IBS patients. And that's all very interesting, but um, these are just observations. So can we link the microbiota and inflammation of irritable bowel syndrome? Well, there are various pieces of evidence which support this. First of all, others have shown raised levels of anti-flagellin antibodies, but not ANCA or ASCA, in IBS. And secondly, others have shown increased levels of <coughs> defense in an IBS, levels which are intermediate between controls and those seen in inflammatory bowel disease, with beta defensin being important in the response to bacterial infection. We chose to look at TOR receptors, and as you know, TOR receptors are a family of receptors that recognize a variety of ligands, including, as highlighted here, TOR receptor 4, which recognizes hypopolysaccharide from gram-negative uh, organisms. So we looked in mucosal biopsies from the colon at TOR receptors in IBS and showed no change in TOR 3, actual downregulation of TOR receptor in TOR 8, and significant upregulation, in fact, the most significant finding regulation of TOR receptor 4. Later, we went on <coughs> to look at, at, at TOR receptors in peripheral blood, 
And again, we looked at cytokines, and again, as previously, of all of the cytokines looked at, only IL-6 and IL-8 were significantly elevated in IBS patients. Has also worked plasma cortisols. But when we looked at, um, can take this again, I'm just looking in hope you human whole blood, we saw, we looked at a variety of TOL receptors, and again, saw upregulation of TOL-4, but this time also saw upregulation of TOL-5 and TOL-8. So, to date, what I've shown you is data from peripheral blood or peripheral blood molecular cells. So the obvious place we need to look at next is at the mucosa. Now, anyone who's ever taken mucosal biopsies will know that this is a very difficult challenge because the depth of your biopsy will provide varying levels of, of tissue, and you get you potential for contamination from stool and for a variety of other factors. So this is not easy. Now, at the time we did our first um, mucosal biopsy studies, we had shown elevated levels of cytokines in peripheral blood. So we were very taken aback when we looked at the expression of a variety of cytokines and chemokines in the mucosa and found that with very few exceptions, these actually were down-regulated, not up-regulated. And this is shown here, where we actually measured chemokines and supernatant following ex vivo biopsy culture. And here we've got IBD as disease controls with elevated levels of non-chemokines and cytokines in IBD, as you would expect but in all instances, lower levels in IBS than either IBD or <coughs> as shown here for IL-1 beta, TNF alpha, and IL-6. <clears throat> so that was surprising, and when we took stock of this a few years ago, um, we summarized the situation as follows. We had seen subtle increases in plasma cytokines in, 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 in IBS, and I've already mentioned these. Um, there was accumulating evidence for potential involvement of gut luteal contents of <coughs> microbiota, food antigens, etc., which I've already mentioned. All this had shown increased epithelial barrier permeability. And others, uh, including uh, those shown here, had shown increased numbers of immune cells in the clonic mucosa and increased activity of CD4 positive T cells in both clonic mucosa and blood. And taken together, these provided a possible mechanistic explanation for this sensitivity or symptom generation. But we still had to deal with this discrepant finding of ours in terms of downregulation of the <coughs> So we chose to look in particular at the interferon pathway um, because type 1 and type 2 interferons are active in chronic inflammation, and there are several examples of this. They're required for effective immune response to viral and bacterial infection, particularly germane to IBS because of post infectious IBS. And activated Th1 CD4 positive T cells produce interferon gamma. And this should result in, an inter in a persistent interferon signature in tissue. Viruses activate type 1 interferon. This could also result in an interferon signature. And viruses tar target the interferon pathway for inactivation. So we began to look at the interferon pathway and which is shown here, uh, type 1, type 2, and type 3, with the different ligands. And you can see that the various intermediates in this pathway include stand um, and gel. So we first looked at the expression interferon pathway genes, and several of them are shown here. And in yellow, I've highlighted those which, whose expression was increased in IPS, interferon 1 beta, interferon gamma, and STAT2. We also found increased alternate expression of interferon-inducible chemokines, CXCR3 and CXCL10, in, in irritable bowel syndrome. That's shown here with down-regulation of CXCL10, CXCL11 in, in IBS patients, but no T7 flux in IBS. And this is actually looking at in the fluorescence of T cell subsets in clonic mucosa, where in contrast to others, we could find no difference in the expression of the of various T cell subsets in neutral bowel syndrome. However, we did make some other observation that CXCR3 was highly expressed in intestinal epithelial cells in IBS. This is normal clonic mucosa here, and here even I can see the expression of CXCR3 is significantly increased in the IBS mucosa. We also went on to look at the production of CXCR10 from IBS mucosa biopsies and from tissue. And as shown here, uh, with stimulation, with anti-CD3, anti-CD28, you see a significantly increased expression of CXCL10 in IBS and elevated levels in plasma. The other interesting observation was that 
if you go to baseline, the expression of various chemokines and cytokines was not increased in IBS. It appeared that IBS tissue was hypersensitive to stimulation. You can see here to release of IL-2, interferon gamma, and IL-17 all significantly increased in IBS patients, but only on stimulation. We'll show here for several of this including chemotherapy. Now, these observations are interesting, but do they have any physiological counterpart? But in a very recently published paper, we looked at the physiological effects of um, superplasma from IBS patients on enteric neurons. And you can see here, this is healthy plasma, <coughs> no effect on IBS. This is using calcium signaling, by the way. And here you can see significant excitation of neurons, and this is shown graphically here, and is also illustrated here. And you can see here the co-localization of the CFOS and calvin shown by the diagram here. We also looked at barrier function in a somewhat limited way and showed that as others have the calvin uh, 4 expression is reduced in IBS, and there was increased flux across membranes in IBS, and this looking at transepithelial resistance, which at baseline was unchanged in, in IBS, but in response to interference, it was significantly impaired, as shown here, in compared to controls. So how does all this come together? So far, we've provided evidence of an altered microbiota in IBS. Others have shown decreased barrier function, and we've provided limited data to support that. We've also provided evidence for an altered interferon pathway, and what appears to be a hyper-responsive CXJL3 chemokine system in IBS with hyper-responsive T-cell response and have also shown immune-mediated activation of submucosal neurons. So, what are the possible explanations for these findings? They're suggesting, they're suggestive of an ongoing immune response to some organic trigger. It could be an altered microbiome. It could be the response to dietary components, or it could <coughs> represent an interaction between dietary components and the immune system. Or, it could represent a latent viral infection in the enteric nervous system. So from this stage of what we're saying is that at baseline in IBS, there are not, there are relatively subtle immunological changes, but when stimulated, the, these patients seem to be hyper-responsive. Now that of course ties in clinically very well with what we see in IBS patients who may be asymptomatic for long periods and then suddenly became very symptomatic. Now there are other cells involved in the immune response and others have looked at mast cells, and have shown increased mast cells, or degranulated mast cells, and increased proteases with neuromodulatory effects. And this actually was one of the original papers where we can see here for mast cells, more degranulating mast cells, but also, very importantly, these authors showed a, that the proximity between mast cells shown here and enteric neurons significantly correlates with the severity of pain in their development. Now, does all of this data mean anything? Does it have any clinical correlates? Well, a few years ago, we looked <coughs> at a central response in IBS. Uh, this was done uh, by colleague Ted Dynan, who's very interested in psychoneuroendocrinology. And here we're looking at the stress response. So this is the ACTH response to CRH. Uh, and as you can see, here's the response in normal division. In IBS subjects, this response is significantly exaggerated, which is quite an unusual finding in itself. But we also went on to show that this exaggerated response is significantly correlated with IL-6 levels in serum. Remember, this was another observation that we had made. The other clinical correlate <coughs> that we've looked at <coughs> was um, this whole issue of early life events and childhood trauma. It has been known for some time that IBS patients, particularly very disabled IBS patients, commonly give a history of childhood trauma. And this is looking at some of our own patients, and you can see here that 51% gave a history of at least one uh, childhood trauma event, 90% gave two, and here are listed as some of the features, death of a loved one, physical abuse, sexual abuse, very similar data to what others have shown. Now, we looked at this actually in an animal model uh, where we looked, tried to look at the interaction between the microbiota and um, physiological parameters. And in this particular study, we used an intervention to disrupt the microbiota, namely a broad spectrum antibiotic vancomycin. And then, much later in life, 
really getting into the equivalent of adolescence to, or early adult life, we looked at behavioral tests and also visceral sensitivity. And as expected, as shown here, uh, sorry, I just need to go back. As shown here, when we gave the antibiotic, we saw dose dependent disruption in the microbiota with vancomycin, but at eight weeks later, well after the antibiotic had finished, the microbiome had returned to normal. <coughs> However, much later, way after the antibiotic had gone, we saw a significant degree of visceral hypersensitivity with a dose dependent uh, decrease in the threshold to visceral sensation and a dose dependent increase <coughs> in the behaviors induced by colonic stimulation, suggesting that the structure of the microbiota in early life is to a permanent change in the integral physiology. So, with all of this, uh, we are suggesting that perhaps a combination of disruption of the microbiota combined with impaired gut barrier function can lead to an immunological response in IBS, which has the potential when stimulated uh, to provoke local and systemic responses. However, we must remember that several of these features could be generated centrally. Indeed, central stimuli can lead to similar immunological changes and disrupt gut barrier function, and there's a lot of interest now in all of this in, in depression, for example. So, this immune activation, could this be centrally driven? We have limited data to suggest that there may be a central component to this. Uh, this is a study where we separated patients uh, with IBS according to their whether or not they have psychiatric comorbidity. These are IL-6 and IL-8 levels in controls. In IBS, as you can see, they're increased, but they're even further increased in patients with com comorbidity. And of course, others have described elevated levels of cytokines in depression. <coughs> and very recently, and this is still not published, uh, Orla Craig, who was a PhD student with us, uh, looked at longitudinal changes in cytokines in IBS, and as before, short changes in IL-6 and IL-8, and then looked at what factors that correlated with these. This shows the, this is looking just at IL-8, and looking at the increased levels, and of the various clinical and physiological factors we looked at, the only things which correlated with the increased levels were anxiety and the presence of severe pain, and interestingly, uh, the presence of proper GI symptoms. <coughs> Does this have any impact centrally? Well, the answer is yes. So this is some very recent data that Paul Kennedy was a psychology PhD student who worked with us and looked at these very sophisticated assessments of cognitive function, the so-called CANTAP test, and showed um, abnormalities in some components of cognitive function in IBS shown here, compared to controls, and also compared to patients with their Crohn's disease. So in summary, IBS, the variable amalgam of common gastrointestinal symptoms, is an important global issue, but one that has not been looked at from a global perspective. Now, fortunately, that's beginning to change, and I think there may be important lessons there, as there have been for IBD and other changes in the area. Though incompletely understood, it is clear that lumen, food and the microbiota, environmental stress, and intrinsic psychological status and gender conspire to induce and precipitate symptoms in IBS. And the complexity of these interactions continues to pose a challenge in terms of the evaluation of these patients clinically and in researching uh, the pathophysiology. Evidence for immune activation in the systemic compartment continues to accumulate and may reflect in part central influences as have been indicated. Immunological changes at the mucosal level may be more complex and could reflect a response to a pathogen or a commensal organism. For the most part, responses in the periphery are not upregulated, but they do seem to be hypersensitive to stimulation. These findings may open new therapeutic avenues for IBS, but as yet, that's the end of So I tend to look at IBS as a spectrum, and this is very simplistic. At the one end, we have individuals who are profoundly stressed with significant psychopathology, and who, as we showed in our microbiota study, make no more pathological or molecular at the other end are people who seem to have some subtle uh, changes. Already we've seen lymphocytic colitis and lymphocytic epithelial ganglionitis being described and really removed from the umbrella of IBS. In these individuals, stress or psyche 
may be precipitant or exacerbated. And in the middle, we've got perhaps the majority of patients with IBS in whom there may be immune activation, disturbed microbiota, food sensitivity, prior bacterial infection, or genetic predisposition, <coughs> or perhaps a combination of these factors which interact and induce stress and psyche as a core factor. Now, finally, I must acknowledge the uh, support of all of my colleagues in court who were involved in all of these work, uh, which includes students, trainees, postdocs, and scientists, my co PIs in the APC, uh, colleagues in elementary health, in uh, or perspective of any of IBS, and my colleagues at the hospital, and in particular the uh, director of the APC and the chair of the Department of Medicine, uh, my long term colleague, Frank Chana. And thank you very much for your attention. Right, quickly, that, that was outstanding. And it, it was, uh, if the lights can come up, please. It, it was a good representation of very strong translational research. You took us from, from a syndrome that everybody's sort of like, at some point, well, maybe it exists or not, to an entity with objective evidence that there's something wrong with you or me. To animal models actually looking at it, we start messing around with certain components from the microbiome to cytokines and so forth that my, I may create similar abnormalities suggesting that we may have a pathway for intervention. And then you showed us all these people because it requires a lot of people and a lot of investment and resources and time and effort to, to make this big science happen. I was intrigued by, by a couple of things. Number one is uh, it seems like the phenotype is still unclear. In fact, you ended with a slide yes. talking about potentially three phenotypes that were actually yes. expected. Yes. And in fact, that suggests to me that one of the problems we have is that since we don't have a marker that says this is true IBS, mm -hmm. that's the difficulty in finding. I wanted you to comment on that. And the second thing is uh, potential treatments uh, like anti-inflammatory agents or probiotics and so forth. OK, the, the phenotype is the killer. And it, it, I think it has been the, the problem and the challenge in IBS research. Uh, not only are there the phenotypes, that, and they are very much my characterization, but there are also phenotypes based on student frequency, uh, diarrhea predominant, constipation predominant, et cetera. So that, they are all major challenges, and it leads to underpowering of a lot of studies. So you need large numbers. But more importantly, and something we forget about in many of the studies, is to adequately characterize the phenotype. If you add, I think if you adequately characterize the phenotype and everybody can understand that, then I think you, you're okay. In many cases, people are lumped together and not adequately phenotyped. Now, the second issue is regards to treatment. Very, some limited data here. There's very, very limited data on anti inflammatories. So, some suggestion of some benefit, but in general, the studies are either small, definitely underpowered, and inconclusive. With regard to um, on the other side, there's no question but that rifaximin, uh, the antibody, does work in IBS in selected individuals, in patients with diarrhea predominant IBS. There have been several clinical trials, I believe there's just another one, uh, at least in the, in the, it's in, been in the newspapers, uh, which has again shown that rifaximin has an impact. That's interesting. What's even more interesting to me is how is it work? We don't know. In terms of probiotics, I didn't show you the data, but we and others have shown that certain probiotics are also effective. Again, how they're working, we don't know. And I think we should be perhaps putting more emphasis on, for example, the refaxman story and seeing those patients who do respond, what is about them that makes them respond, and what exactly the mechanisms are. Then I'll have one other thing that is interesting to me is that the, the more normal your microbiota, yes. the more anxious you are, That's which right. was interesting. Yeah. Ted. I have two, two questions or observations. First is that. Uh, you had said that uh, CXCO3 is elevated and ILA, which is actually a chemokine, yes. uh, is elevated. So you have two chemokines that are actually uh, bringing in uh, uh, PMNs right. uh, into the tissue. So you showed some T cell data, but you didn't really, which is important in inflammatory bowel disease, but you didn't really talk about PMNs, which also have neutral peptidases and things like that that could potentially induce remodeling of this, yeah. and, you know, the entire nervous system. Sure. sure. Now, the, the question was about polymer, polymorphonuclear cells and whether given the observations on IL-8 and CXCL3, whether these were, were increased. What I didn't say was all of these biopsies were submitted for conventional histology and we did not see any infiltration of polymorphonuclear cells. 
where he, just to get, to qualify your question, in terms of in the biopsies at baseline, we don't see significant changes. We see a change in expression, uh, but it's when they're stimulated that things really light up, which is, which is I think, the interesting part of it. And then the uh, typical cytokines that are associated with uh, disruption in mucosal integrity, such as IL-1, beta, TNF, and interferon gamma, uh, were not really elevated uh, significantly at baseline. Which is Except in the individuals who have a comorbidity, which I think is interesting. Um, We've not explored that. But I, there, we have other data on um, epithelial barrier function, which in general shows that there are changes in barrier function. We did some muscle chamber work, et cetera, which did show changes, particularly in response to some agonists. But that's, the, but that's that what you say is, is very important because the temptation here is to say this is, a, this is like inflammatory bowel disease. It's not. It's nothing like inflammatory bowel disease. It's completely different. What I didn't show you was when you calprotect him repeatedly, and calprotect is completely normal in these patients. I should have added that to your first question. Questions? I'm intrigued about the embryologic and childhood origins of disease in adults. Yes. Tell me more about that, about the idea that these people often have these experiences during childhood, or even uh, illness, yes. where they could have been subjected to antibiotics. You would think that people with cystic fibrosis, asthma, and all these other entities that often lead with significant use of antibiotics and, and other stresses might have more irritable bowel syndrome. Would that, is that the case? Well, the, that's a complicated question. The, the, the original observations here came from Dr. Osman in North Carolina. Um, and he showed a very high rate of history of childhood or adolescent abuse in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. Now that study was criticized because you were dealing with not just a tertiary but a quaternary referral center. And when later studies performed in the community suggest that rates were lower. But there does seem to be, particularly in patients who are referred, and there is a very interesting selection bias in IBS, which relates to referral, or patients who are, are self-referred, that in those there is a significant history of childhood traumas of both sides. Our data is no different than anybody else. How exactly this factors in is unclear. Um, it has been shown in a lot of other related disorders like fibromyalgia, etc. Um, but it, although some have ex explained it on the basis of, of <coughs> central imprinting, etc. But it, really, it has not been satisfactorily explained. Um, in terms of the microbiota, there are a number of disparate observations which suggest that interventions or factors that interfere with the microbiota in early life may be very significant for later events. And the best data is coming from inflammatory bowel disease rather than irritable bowel syndrome, where um, the group in Winnipeg have shown that antibiotic use in childhood, the more antibiotic use, the earlier it's used, is a significant risk factor for later inflammatory bowel disease. And there's other data from other disorders yeah. as well. So that's you mentioned gluten. How about lactose? La gluten and lactose are highly controversial in relation to, I know it's like here in Nuba, but everybody in Houston is on a gluten-free diet. <laughs> <laughs> and not, and, and very, only minority of celiac disease. Um, the latest data suggests that the FODMAPs are probably the most important. Lactose intolerance in IBS is probably not a major factor. You, get, you can get acute IBS-type symptoms from exposure to lactose, but lactose doesn't cause chronic symptoms in, in general. But in terms of the... Um, the gluten story, it's probably not gluten, but most, the greatest source of gluten is, of course, wheat, which also contains fructans in high amounts. Mm -hmm. So maybe the fructans rather than the gluten, so maybe the tolerance rather than the allergy. Interesting. If you walk around Kentucky, you'll find out that not many of us are on diets. <laughs> uh, now, when Tom was introducing you, he mentioned all these great attributes and your accomplishment, but he also said that you were a great <coughs> academic medicine leader and politician. <laughs> and and it, it, being a Methodist, I, I, Hopwood and UT, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, politics don't always work well. No. We're dealing with the Baylor people and all that. <laughs> so we have, we have a tradition here. We have a tradition here to give a Louisville slugger right. to our speaker from the outside. And this is Dr. M.M. M. M. Quigley, Medicine Ground Rounds, University of Louisville, September 18, 2014. Thank you very much. Thank you.